And when we talk about Christianity in this country specifically, because of our tendency to professionalize this, the, my job, is that when we talk about Christianity, we talk about it from a distance. We talk about it from, from an observation standpoint. We talk about it from a very personal standpoint. And yet what the people can, of God can do together will change the world. What the people of God can do together can change the world. And when you stop and think about that, you, you, you realize that, that not one of us can be a spectator. Not one of us can, can sit back and watch if, if something like that tugged on your heartstrings. Because what happened there, and at the end of the, end of the service, we're going to pray for another young woman who has a call of God on her life that has great opportunities in the coming weeks to go to D.C. for a leadership conference. What the people of God can do when they are motivated and, and when they are called and not just watching will transform an entire world. Like if you and I have, have ever, if you, you're like me and, and you sit and you read not the Gospels, but the narrative from Matthew 28 forward, you have to start wondering what and why things happened how they happened. Right, you, 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 you stop. For some of you, you might know that part of my job is not just being a local pastor, but, but I have the privilege of talking to, to young men and women who are called to plant churches. And so I get to talk to them and coach them and talk them off a ledge when it goes bad. I, I'll go next month to Nashville and, and sit and listen to people, really smart national leaders, talk about what it takes to, to begin a church in North America in the 21st century. And it's a fascinating thing, but you sit there, and when you think about that, and you have all these conversations with these people that are passionate about the kingdom of God, you begin to ask yourself, it's like, what caused what? Right? When, you, when you look at 100 AD, church history, there's 25,000 churches, or 25,000 Christians in the world. 100 AD, 25,000 Christians. They were ridiculed, they were despised, they were a, a part of a um, group of people that, that were pushed. Some cities in, in the Roman Empire would tolerate a Christian, but for the most part, if they pushed too hard, they would be persecuted or put to death. It was an illegal religion with an ostracized group of people, and it started with a small group of folks. 200 years later, scholars say there were 20 million. From 25,000 to 20 million in 200 years. And you begin to wonder, what caused it? What caused Christianity to explode? Right? They... they they didn't have any professional clergy, so nobody was making the big bucks standing up in front of people talking. They didn't have buildings. Right? They, mo most of the places that they met were in, in, in smaller homes, converted things. They, they just met in small groups. They were affluent and poor, young and old, married and single. They were Jews and Gentiles and, and Judaizers. They were the gamut of society that made up these people. They weren't the religious leaders of the day because the religious leaders of the day sought to, to, to destroy them, sought to, to silence this, this new myth of Jesus raising from the dead. They weren't state-sponsored. If you know anything about Roman they was, it was viewed, Christianity was viewed as in direct conflict with the Roman government. And yet in 200 years, they went to 20 million and changed the course of history and changed the course of this world. Changed the course of history. And if you look at what they started with, they started with a bunch of dirt balls. That's an original Greek word. <laughs> I mean, if you look at the 12 men that Jesus picked, it was like they weren't, they weren't the 12 top guys on LinkedIn. 
right? They were just folks. They were mostly blue collar. They were fishermen. They were, they were tax collectors. One was a doctor. They were just, just people. And then if you looked at a little bit more, the peripheral 70, you see affluent men and women that would support the ministry. And you would see men and women contributing to this thing that Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Share the good news in Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And then you show up in Acts, and you see these, these people sitting huddled in an in a upper room, waiting. Just a small group of people, but 200 years later, the world would be changed. And, and, and you sit, and you're like going, what was it? They didn't have a massive youth group. They didn't have LED lights. They didn't have a rockin' worship band. They might have had three rows of college. They might have had Frank on the front row. <laughs> Every church needs a Frank on the front row. <laughs> but if you look at the Bible, they, they, did, they weren't playing with a stacked deck. And yet they changed the world. And what intrigues me about pastoring this place and hearing Cesar's story is that men and women, you guys, can make a difference in the world that you live in. You guys. And the re how you do that is how my brother does it. You live in the big Bible word is incarnationally. You live as the hands and feet and mouthpiece of God to the world in which you live in. And in doing that, you present a gospel that makes sense to the community that you're a part of. You guys. And so this whole message, these whole last four weeks and next week, is about breaking the myth that the Christianity is dependent on the pastor to make anything worthwhile happen. Because I couldn't have done that. I couldn't have got in a canoe and traveled four hours up the Amazon River and do this, but I know someone that can. Do you see the difference? I can't minister to a group of women on a Saturday and do a clothing exchange and just share the good news of Jesus with ladies and invite some dear woman, share her wisdom. I can't do that, but I know someone that can. God knows I can't lead worship. Can I get an amen? amen? I can lead worship, but I know people that can. And my job as the pastor is to release all those people to do good works. To do good works. And the joy that I have, and the privilege that I have as a pastor, is not to protect the keys to the kingdom. The joy and the privilege and the honor I have is to celebrate what you do in the name of Jesus, to bring Him glory, to extend the kingdom of God in the communities you're a part of, in the communities that you travel in, in the, in the influence that you have. And my challenge is to convince you all that you can make a difference in the world that you live in. That you can. And that sitting in this chair, because this chair is empty, who usually sits here? Tony. Tony, I'm in Tony. Ooh, powerful chair. <laughs> you see, the church isn't about sitting in this chair looking this way, looking at a pretty cool store-bought image about tools and going, man, I hope this guy picks it up because I'm about ready to take a nap. <laughs> or going, oh, why... Did they have to play that song? <laughs> I don't like that song. <laughs> why don't we pray more or sing less or sing more and pray less? Why, why do we bring people up? Why do we have a... 
Rachel come up and do this? Why, why, why is that room always empty? There should be people there. Who's going to invite them? See, that's not church. That's a show. That's entertainment. The church of Jesus Christ is a force in this world. And the church of Jesus Christ is you guys who profess faith in Christ, who the psalmist says, and we talked about this last week, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that you were knitted together in your mother's wombs, that you admit that God's works are wonderful, and that he has equipped you with gifts and talents to make a difference in the world that you have. And we talked about the difference between talents, and talents are things that, that you inherently have. Talents aren't tied to your faith in Christ. Talents are given to you by a creative God to make you good. And so in this building, we have mechanics, and we have musicians, and we have graphic designers, and we have students, and we have teachers. We have people that can swing a hammer, that we people that can weld. We have people that can keep the attention of a junior high class. We have people that are great students. We have people that are great with numbers and other peoples that I'm married to. If you say the word number, their eyeballs roll in the back of their head and they twitch. <laughs> but that same person can draw. And talents are something that point to God, but talents are not gifts. You see, in Ephesians, are gifts. Gifts are given by the people, by God, to the people of God for the work of the ministry. We have people that are athletic here. We have people that, that, that are great organizers. We have leaders here. We have teachers here. We have people that are inherently good with their hands here. We have people that can tear apart a tranny and put it back together and we celebrate that and we point to God's goodness in that. That's a talent. That's inherent. That is not limited to my faith. But in here, there are something that, that's, that's different and something that I hope operates within the body of Christ. It says, God gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip. Everybody say equip. To equip the saints. Point to yourself. Ah, uh, yeah. Now point to your neighbor. It makes them more uncomfortable. <laughs> to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Anybody want to know why there are apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers? It is in that. To equip the saints, you guys. Everybody said me. me. Everybody say me. me. Better. To equip me for the work of the ministry for building up the body of Christ. We'll get a couple things out of the way really quick. The gifts of the ministry are not to tear down, to beat, to condemn, to hurt the body of Christ. Because you are prophetic doesn't give you a right to slam someone upside the head. In the immortal words of God told me, if you have a word, if you operate in the gifts, it is to build up and to edify the body of Christ for you guys to equip each other for the work of the ministry. It is not a hammer to destroy. The gifts that are from God are here to build up each other to build up each other. And if there was ever a time in human history that needs the people of God to be the people of God, it is today. We do not model what the world values. We do not model the partisanship and the hatred and the vitriol that it permeates our media. We model the love of Christ that is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. The apostles are the sent ones. They're the guys that kind of go and do crazy stuff. The apostles are the guys that will figure out how to plant a church on Pearl Street. 
and make it work. The apostles dream big dreams and then they get everybody to go along. The apostles are the ones that remind everybody that this is what God's called us to do and this is what we're doing. The prophets hear God. They are able to discern and they're able to communicate God's will. They question the status quo. Prophets hate. This is what we always have done. Prophets are the people in the, in the meetings that will go, uh, I know that this is a really good plan, but did we pray about it? Prophets always point people back to God. The evangelists are the storytellers. The evangelists are the car salesmen of the kingdom of God. Evangelists sell anybody anything, but the evangelists working in, in the kingdom of God bring the good news of Jesus to the unbeliever in a way that the unbeliever goes, Oh, seriously? You mean he died for me? Evangelists are the gatherers. Shepherds are the caregivers. Pastors. They're the ones that will show up at a hospital and sit with you. They will pray for you. They will hug you. They are empathetic. They care and love the people of God. And they share it so well. And teachers are able to take profoundly complex truths and communicate it in such a way that it makes sense. Right? And in 23 Church, this is in case you don't know where you're at right now, you're in 23rd Avenue Church, Greeley, Colorado. Welcome. <laughs> if you're here this morning and you look around, and in this body of Christ, there are apostles and prophets and evangelists and shepherds and teachers. And to each of them, each of you, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Everybody say common good. Common good. The gifts of the Spirit are not to make you feel special. Not to get you a mic. Not to get you FaceTime up in front of the church. Unless you want it, then come talk to me. <laughs> the gifts of the Holy Spirit are meant for the common good. To build up. And when they work together, it's amazing. But for any of us that have sat in church for a long time, you know that it doesn't always go together that well. If you've ever been hurt by a church, you've probably been hurt by a church because the leader of the church has been one of these and never let anybody else be a part of any of the fun. Like if you've ever been part of a church led by an apostolic individual, they will get you there, but man, they will kill everybody in the process. They will tie you to a rope and drag you to where God told you to be. And if you, ah, he's dead. Cut him loose. Let's go. It's done in love, sort of. But really an, ap an apostolic person will only, will get you there. But if it's only him, man, it's a tough road. Because they forget the people in, in lieu of the destination. Right, a prophetic one, if you have someone that's a prophetic, it's all spiritual, 24-7. It's like they just, everybody glows in the dark. Is there any meat to anything? Sometimes, but most of it's hyper-spiritual, hyper-labeled, and it's, it's somewhat myopic. If it's run only by an evangelist, we're only about people bringing to Christ, but never about growing anybody into maturity. We'll gather a bunch of people, but then they'll leave. And it's an inch wide or an inch deep and a mile wide. If you go to a church that's only led by a pastor, you feel loved. You and 30 other of your closest friends. <laughs> most of the churches in America are small, not because that there's not gifts there, but because most of them are led by people who desperately love their people. And in desperately loving their people, they can't open it up to everything else because only one person can love so much. 
And so that's why there's normally 40 or 60 people in a church pastored by a pastor because, man, you're loved. But it becomes exclusive. Right? It becomes a, a very, very tight-knit community. It really doesn't open to anybody because it's like the pastor becomes pretty close to God. And I can't let anybody else minister to me because the pastor has to show up. The pastor has to do this and the pastor has to do that. And if the pastor goes, hey, you know what? They'll be there. That's not good enough. And if a teacher is the only one that leads the church, then everything becomes about here and never about your heart. And the gospel becomes an intellectual exercise where, where theology is, is, is and doctrine is debated over and over and over again. But you can't give room to the Holy Spirit because, well, I need to teach my 17 points. But the kingdom of God is never meant to be just one. Right? That's why Paul writes to the Corinthians and uses the analogy of the body because we know that a body works best in concert with other aspects of the body. And any functional church, any profound influence in the community and in the culture requires an integrated working of these gifts. And you guys possess them. I know my wife's going to laugh at this one. I know this is going to shock you guys that have been here for more than a couple years. But I'm not that great of a pastor shepherd guy. I love you, but with a stopwatch attached. <laughs> but I can be compassionate for a period of time. But when the period of time's over, I have to go do something. I got to do something. And some of you are like going, I knew you were like that. That's why I have other people in my life that love you guys. <laughs> like without a stopwatch I'll sit and love on you and man that makes me happy that makes me so thrilled some of you guys are better teachers than me so I ask you for help the, the, the young woman that gets up here and says hi for this month she's an evangelist gathers and gathers and gathers and gathers and gathers and she's amazing and I like honor that because it manifests the kingdom of God in a, in a way that, that are healthy. Right? Gifts are used to fulfill God's purposes in the community that we're a part of. Gifts are not meant to go, hey, look at me. I'm a prophet. <laughs> <laughs> and if you've been in Pentecostal circles before, you know it's the office of the prophet. And I used to have, and I still, he's a dear friend, but he used to drive me crazy because, look, I got a word from God, and it was always bad. <laughs> I was told one time, it's like, and it, this one happened to be true. No, this was from you. <laughs> yes, this was from you. I see, what did you say? I see fire, but you're not, no, you're going to be broken, but not crushed. Oh, happy me. <laughs> that was actually true. I went through a period of time where I was like, I'm pretty sure you're crushing me, God. I'm a little bitty pieces. But you're not. You're just broken. But the, but the gifts of God are meant for His kingdom and His glory Amen. and His church to make a difference. You see, they confirm God's presence in you. They confirm God's presence in your life. Nobody here that knows Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior can ever say that they're alone. You can isolate yourself and be encouraged to be in community, and I believe that that's necessary. But if you ever want to talk about your own self-worth and understand that the gifts that you manifest in your life are testimonies to God's goodness and His value that He sees on you because He has challenged you and trusted in you enough to entrust one of the very gifts that extend the kingdom of God through the world. 
they equip you for ministry. Everybody, you. They equip you for ministry. You. If I could get us a, a, a washable tattoo on our hands, it would say, he's talking about you. You. You are equipped for the works of the ministry. Not Dave. Dave just won a many. Dave was called by God to be a pastor of a local church. So I have been equipped by certain things that allow me not to fail miserably at that. Some of you might want to write a letter about that one. But that's just me. The joy of life living in the body of Christ in relationship to one another is to realize that every single person here has been equipped to do the work of the ministry. Everybody. Everybody. There's no age limit on that one. One of the most profound, one of the most profound lessons I received was as a 22-year-old youth pastor in a church camp in California. It was Holy Spirit night. This little girl was freaked out and she left and so it gave me a reason to leave too. And so I went and sat by her by the snack bar. And she was like 13 at the time. I'm like, what's wrong? Yeah, that freaked me out. Like, yeah, I understand that. Freaked me out too. I go, well, what do you want? She goes, man, I would love to experience Jesus. And I think I want the Holy Spirit, but not, not all that crazy. Like, so can we pray? And they're in a log without any of the bells and whistles and lights and crazy adult things that adults do at church camp when the youth are around. So you see the baptism of the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues, cried, and we hugged, and I bought her hot chocolate. In that order. And she taught me that gifts in the ministry have nothing to do with lights have nothing to do with a mic in your hand, everything to do with a willingness to be obedient when God opens up a door for you. Every single person here in this room will have a door open to them this week or this month. And the choice is whether you go through it or not, or whether you, you disregard that opportunity that God has given you, that God has entrusted you with, because it doesn't fit your idea of what someone like you should be able to do, but you, my friends, have been equipped by God himself, the author and creator of everything that we see, to do the work of the ministry. So the ministry might be in a classroom. The ministry might be as a student. The ministry might be as a, as a mechanic. The ministry might be as a carpenter. The ministry might be as an as a office manager. The ministry might be as a stay-at-home mom. The ministry might be anything. The ministry might send you to Starbucks to smile at a barista that had the worst possible day in their life and you just have this call of God on your heart it's like you're doing a good job thank you for a great cup of coffee and the work of the ministry might bring you to four hours down the Amazon bringing shoes to a group of kids that wanted to keep them on their feet because they didn't want to get dirty or for some of you you'll go with me to Burma and try to figure out how to teach Hebrews. And for others of you, you will tell me how I'm supposed to teach Hebrews <laughs> to a group of people in Burma. To do the work of the ministry. To do the work of the ministry. So, worship team, can you guys come back up here? You see, these gifts are important because the body of Christ needs you. These gifts are important because the body of Christ needs you. 23rd Avenue Church needs an active, participating believers so that they can have influence not only here, but in every place we set foot on. So your generosity touches five villages in a, in a, in a country the 99% of us will never go. So your smile makes someone feel welcome when they walk in these doors. 
So when you go to another country, you reflect Christ in a way that doesn't make sense, maybe to you, but to the people that you're talking to. So that you make a difference in the world that you're a part of. So that you bring the good news of Jesus to a world in desperate need of it. He equipped you. What a blast that is.